Hey, you guys, welcome to Remnant Radio. Uh, in this video, we'd like to talk about four misconceptions about divine healing. First misconception, God will not heal you because of something you've done. I'd like to give you three reasons why that's not true. First, if God did not spare his own son, how will he not freely give you all things? What's not included in all things? Is divine healing not included in all things? Last I checked, all things means all things, including divine healing. A uh, second reason why that's not true. James chapter five, verse 14 through 16 says, is anybody, anybody sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. If anything, this passage shows you that God is both willing to forgive your sins and heal you of your sickness. The implication is even if there is a sickness that you have that was caused by your sin, God is willing to both forgive you of your sin and heal you of your sickness. The third reason, you are not uniquely bad. If God promised the thief on the cross to be with him in paradise for eternity, don't you think that means that Jesus would also forgive you? Um, if, he's, if he's willing to give you salvation and forgive you of even the worst of sins, healing is small in comparison. This conception number two, Jesus healed instantly and absolutely every single time. I'm going to give you four reasons why that's not true. The first reason is called an argument from silence. To draw a conclusion on something scriptures are silent about is an objection that only fits for those who presuppose that God doesn't heal. The second reason, uh, we actually see on one occasion, Jesus pray for a man twice who was blind. The scriptures from Mark chapter eight, verse 23 to the 25. Then they came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man to Jesus and asked him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand, brought him outside the village. Then he spit on his eyes, placed his hands on his eyes and asked, do you see anything? Regaining his sight, he said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again. And he opened his eyes, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. If Jesus had to pray more than once for a blind man to be healed, what does that say about us? Unless we think we're better at it than he was. But also we see another example of this where uh, the Gadarene demoniac said that Jesus had been saying to the demon, come out of him. And yet the demon's still inside the man. So eventually Jesus gets some more information and then sets the man free. If again, Jesus had to do it on more than one occasion or more than one time on, in that occasion. Another reason in Nazareth, we're told that Jesus could do no mighty miracles because of their unbelief. Now this probably happened for several reasons or possible reasons. Uh, one, maybe Jesus just couldn't do it. Secondly, Maybe, uh, maybe nobody came to him. You know, in James, it says you do not have because you do not ask. Or thirdly, maybe Jesus chose not to heal everybody because of their unbelief. Maybe he was honoring their freedom to rebel and, and, and reject him as Messiah. And so he responded to that by choosing not to heal them. The last reason, uh, well, in Luke 5, 17, it says that there was power present for him to perform miracles. Why does Luke say this? Unless there's an implication in this that there are times when there's power present and times when there's power not present. Misconception number three, God uses sickness to bring us closer to him. Now on this one, I'm going to give you three reasons for why I don't believe that's true. And I, I'll say this on the front end. I don't think that's never true. I think there are occasions when God would use sickness, but most of the time what people are claiming that God is using the sickness to bring them closer to him, I don't believe God is the author of their sickness. Uh, majority of the times when people say this, they're using one verse of scripture that comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh. Now, in order to understand that passage, we have to understand what says before he gets this thorn in the flesh. We're told that Paul, and he won't even talk about himself in this, he'll use the third person. It says, he knows a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But this man heard revelations. He was taken up into the third heaven where he heard things that he's not allowed to repeat or that are unlawful for a man to repeat. And because of these revelations, Paul was given a thorn in his flesh. So next time somebody tells you, maybe this is just my, my thorn in my flesh when they're talking about their disease, ask them the question, 
Really? Did you go up into the third heavens? Did you hear things and revelations from God that you're not permitted to speak? Um, but also, let's take this, this idea to its next conclusion. If God is the one causing your sickness and he's using it to teach you some lesson, why then do we go to the doctors? Don't you think that maybe you're going up against God's will by trying to remove a sickness that he wants to use to bring you closer to him? Thirdly, why not ask for something worse? If you're learning so much from this disease, why not ask for something more debilitating like cancer or, or some sort of in incurable infirmity? Misconception number four, won't it destroy someone's faith if they're not healed? First off, the majority of times I've prayed for people, whether they're healed or not healed, People are always incredibly thankful that you are vulnerable enough to look so foolish and pray for them. Secondly, you claim too much responsibility for the faith of others. It is not your job to determine the results. It's just your job to be faithful to pray and your job to be faithful to evangelize, which leads me to my third point. Um, God doesn't need us. If he was so insecure about his own reputation, then he would have never asked us to be his evangelist to begin with. If you'd like to learn more about why we practice the gifts, check out Josh's video up here in the top right. If you'd like to learn more about the gifts in general, check out our playlist here down on the bottom right.